Hi everyone, I'm Georgina O'Neill and I, as you know, am a member of the Cork Humans Group and this evening we've invited Alan Tuffery to give us a talk on education. What sort of education do we want? Um, so I'm going to start off this with just saying that I have been in touch with Cork Penny Dinners and I want to put it out there so that people can start collecting that I will be sending around a list of all of the stuff that Katrina needs. She said this year more than ever, she's really relying on us because obviously a lot of money is going towards our friends in the Ukraine and rightly so. But with bad weather and with, um, with really bad weather and the need for good clothing, the need for sleeping bags, the need for all sorts of different stuff, um, she has raised the fact that she really appreciates the fact that we do this every year and we are hoping that I will put together packages that we might be asking people to undertake to supply Katrina with. I'll explain that to you when I send a general email around. We're also looking at, again, trying to give the children in direct provision a Christmas treat so we're looking and talking to our local theatres to see if they will hand over seats to us. Um, and I will, I will, you know, update you on that as soon as I know how that's going to work out. <coughs> so I'm going to hand you over to Alan Tuffrey, who is going to chat to us about education in general and raises the question, what sort of education do you want? Thank you, Geraldine. Yes, education, which is very important for all of us, I'm going to ask really four questions. Why is it important? What does it do? What should it do? And are we using education to the best advantage? I expect the discussion to go where it will go. Humanists are good at having ideas and asking questions. So I start by introducing some ideas and then we'll see how it goes from there. Feel free to challenge anything I say because I deliberately make sweeping statements in order to introduce some ideas, not just for the sake of being provocative, although I might do that too. Um, by education, I mean formal education, the 10 years or so that every citizen in this state now spends in school and sometimes rather longer in school. Uh, there are bound to be teachers and ex-teachers present so that makes them experts. I'm a, I'm a, I think I'm a teacher too uh, but I taught in universities and my wife who is a real teacher that is to say a trained teacher of children tells me that I'm not a proper teacher so uh, although I've been doing it for 40 <laughs> odd years uh, I'm still not a proper teacher. That's, she's probably right. She's right about everything else. <laughs> uh, so the kind of headings I've got are, what's the significance of education? And that's particularly in a humanist context. What kind of things make individual human beings what they are? And that's quite a broad question. We'll, we'll come to that and I'll try and deal with it quickly. How can we improve ourselves is another way of looking at that. Another way of dealing with what is the current view of education? What view does the state take of education? And then lastly, the really important question, what should education do? What do we think as humanists that education is for? What should it be trying to achieve? Now, the significance of education, especially for us humanists, um, I think is best looked at in, by taking an evolutionary view. And in this I follow uh, very much the, the thinking of Julian Huxley, who's a an intellectual hero of mine. It's a useful frame of thinking, to my way of thinking anyway. It's a long-term view. So where are we in our evolution as human beings? We're a long, long way from the slow biological evolution over the course of millennia, the sort of time period over which uh, early humans learned to stand upright, uh, learned to speak, shed most of their hair, and so on. We're now in what Huxley calls the psychosocial phase, he loved fancy words, the psychosocial phase, that really is defined by the very rapid transfer of information. Uh, so skills, organisations, structures, all sorts of things are spread very rapidly. We know how quickly uh, a meme can flash around the world 
and, and fake news can flash around the world. That's part of what we are. That's our new evolution. Um, so the way Huxley put it was that humans uniquely are conscious of their future and what they can do and what that future could be and capable of acting to achieve an end. So he put it by saying that humans are the sole agents of evolution. We can know and choose our role and act to fulfil it. So it's a practical idea. He had lots of, uh, in his wonderful essay, The Humanist Frame, um, in a book of the same name, um, he looks at this evolutionary idea and looks at it across a whole range of human activities. And I think that, uh, and he uh, try, tries out various things. And he talks a lot about education, as you might expect. Um, he's influenced by lots of ideas of his time, but that's acceptable. So, but what do we need as a species? We need adaptability. We all know that we're facing existential crisis. We've got climate change, which is running away with us faster than we can cup ourselves on and do something about it. Climate change that we knew was happening 60 years ago, by the way, as we knew there was going to be a pensions problem and various other problems, and we've not done much about it. Now we have a real crisis, and there are others out there too. We need adaptability. That's our, that's our great skill as humans. We need even more of it. And uh, as humanists, that means helping every individual to develop their potential, to be the, the most developed individual that they can be. We're all different. We all have different skills and different potentials. And we don't know what skills and attributes are going to be important in the future. We think we know what's been important in the past, but we haven't made such a good job of it. So that leads me on to the next question. What makes us the way we are? The current thinking at the uh, last end of the last century and well in the first 20 years of this one, um, genes have an effect, they're an important effect. They predispose, that's all they do, predispose certain traits and personality and other skills. But in virtually no case do genes account for more than 50% of the variability. So you've got a gene or a set of genes for something, there's 50, that will push you towards it 50% of the way, or less, mostly less. So this means that everything else is more important than genes, what we might call environment. Mm -hmm. Now, there are two components of the environment. One is what's called the shared environment. They have their own little jargon, these people. The shared environment, which essentially means your family. And it turns out that's not very important. So lay off parents. <laughs> uh, parents... No, I think if you've got a grotty, ill-behaved six-year-old, I think you can blame your parents pretty much. Um, but if you've got uh, a 36-year-old who's an ill-behaved uh, delinquent of some kind, then it's probably not entirely due, due to the parents. Uh, this comes about from studies of twins and so on and all of the usual things. So uh, shared environment's not very important. That leaves the non-shared environment, which is everything else. And what's probably the single most important component of the non-shared environment? Education, because we all spend 10 years early in life at least doing that. So education is really important. But the beauty of education is that it's controllable. We can control what education does. And we can put in the content we want to put on. And we can put, devise aims that we want to put in. So let's look at the third question. Um, what are the current views of education? Certainly the view that uh, of the state appears to have two aims for education. To stuff as much information as possible into children. Uh, and the second one is what I'm going to call here training. That is to say, to fit people for the world of work. I think both of these are really poor ideas. Because uh, knowledge changes. Uh, just think of uh, the ideas of Darwin have changed and uh, been changed several times. Uh, Einstein's ideas have changed. Just think of this wonderful uh, James Webb Space Telescope, which is producing completely new knowledge beyond anything we could have imagined six months ago. 
It's an extraordinary rate of change and development of knowledge. But even more important, knowledge is transient. You don't keep knowledge. Anybody who's mugged up stuff for an exam, and we've probably all done it, um, I could classify the invertebrates, uh, most of the invertebrates, brilliantly at Christmas 1963. <laughs> By Easter 1963, I had been pushed to do half of it because I mugged it up for an exam. And tedious enough it was too, but I was bloody good at it. Uh, not very useful. Um, I'm, now, I do know that there is a classification for these things, and I could probably drag out the basics of it if I thought about it. But knowledge is not permanent. It doesn't stay in. And banging a lot of knowledge into people's heads isn't terribly useful. Um, so if I asked around, I'm not going to do this, by the way, because uh, I don't believe in humiliating people <laughs> too much. Um, I wonder how many people could define osmosis, for example, or even knew, knew there was a thing called osmosis, or could remember how to solve simultaneous equations. I certainly can't. I could define osmosis if I thought about it long <laughs> enough, but then I am a biologist. But simultaneous equations have long gone, as more than 60 years gone. But uh, maybe it's enough to know that there is something called osmosis and it's something to do with the movement of material in solutions. Maybe it's enough to know that there are such things as simultaneous equations and that they can be solved. That's perhaps grown-up knowledge. So if I find a situation where I think I've got simultaneous equations, I can go and find out how to solve them. And it's not terribly hard, I gather. So I think bashing knowledge into, into people, uh, literally in the old days, not quite so literally now, I'm happy to say. But we need to think about what we're trying to teach people. We're better off teaching people how to find out stuff and how to have a frame to fit facts into facts and information are not knowledge and that's a very important lesson i think the idea of training for the workplace i think is equally stupid and unrealistic because who knows what jobs are going to be around in 20 or 30 years time nobody does right nobody does uh, look at the job title titles and the roles that people have in the world of work now unimaginable titles almost meaningless titles to some of us and we don't know what people do when they describe themselves with their official job titles. Even more importantly, uh, there may be fewer jobs in the future. And that we may be better working sh much shorter hours. And there's already talk, talk of 30-hour weeks and four-day weeks uh, and all that sort of thing. So those two bases of pushing facts into people's heads and training for the world of work is pretty unrealistic. So that leads us to the last question. What should education do? Um, so if you're not educating for the world of work, what are you educating for? And I think you're educating for living. It's always nice to have a Greek, an ancient Greek tucked up your sleeve. So I've got an Aristotle today. <laughs> I like quotations, but it's always good to have an ancient Greek. It makes sense as though you know stuff. Uh, <laughs> education is the best provision for the journey to old age. And I think the important word there is journey, mm -hmm. an overworked word these days, but we are all on a journey to old age. Uh, and that's, that's called life. It's not about old age, it's about the journey. So you need to be educated so that you can live a good life that is fulfilling and allows you to develop in all sorts of ways. And I think that, that should be the aim. Now, what do you need to do that? Now, I'm going to name a couple of things. Now, I don't claim to have the answers, and I'm sure we can tease those out and you'll, you'll want to add more, and I hope you do. Um, we need to use our massive brains, and they are massive, uh, to use them much better, to create better technologies, better politics, based on cooperation. Because if we don't cooperate, we're going to die as a species. Uh, we're not doing as well as we should in that department, I submit. I think education should teach critical thinking, an easy phrase to try. That involves reasoning, debate, logic, a fundamental understanding of probability or risk, 
Think of the things you read every day, surveys of this risk of that disease, this risk of something else. You need to understand that at a good level, a basic level. And another thing is how to assess the quality of information that comes your way. And then there's a whole set of stuff around that. We can perhaps tease that out. What I broadly call philosophy, which I think is overlapping with critical thinking, how to make an argument, uh, what Carl Sagan politely calls baloney detection, which is not the <laughs> phrase most of us use, uh, and something about values. People need to be able to assess values. What makes a good person? What makes a good society? What makes a good organisation? What makes certain things beautiful? Uh, and finally, I think how we know things is more important than what we know. Understanding where knowledge comes from is really important. As a scientist, of course, I go straight to things like testability. Can you test that idea? Can you get repeatable observations about that? Uh, and does your set of observations and your ideas have predictive value uh, about that? So that's basically what I want to say. And so time for everybody else to sharpen their pencils. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. Um, do we have any questions? Can I ask, in today's world, maybe in the Twitterverse and stuff like that, I don't know, are you familiar with Twitter? I've read about it, I'm an academic. <laughs> <laughs> the, it's, it's constantly, I guess, um, how do we verify? For example, you, you brought up fake news. Mm. How would you today verify that since everything seems to be available on the net, your opinion seems to be available on the net to be confirmed for you. Your predetermined bias can be found on the net if you want to find it there. Yeah, yeah, totally. how, how do we determine what's real? Is there a real? Is there a, is there a thing called a fact anymore? Since everyone yes. seems to get what they want off the net and I'm glad the good friend Noel isn't here because he points out frequently and loudly that nothing is real yeah uh, and of course he's right I suppose we, we, are, are, we, are, we have to we have to live in a different kind of world whereas well, that's real we're, <laughs> we're diverging <laughs> slightly off the top but, but I think yes we do need to know and it's hard uh, in some of the parts of the internet and Twitter 140 160 characters whatever it is 260 yeah. um, I don't think you could say anything very useful in 160 characters, frankly. No. I wouldn't bother. But um, that, as may be, you, you have to say, does it fit with what else I know? If it doesn't fit, where does it come from? And now, you have to kind of use authority here, which is a slightly dodgy concept. Who says it? Mm. Now, I think we've learned over the last few years, there are certain people, you assume that they're probably telling you a lie. You know, somebody could tell sure. 30,000 registered lies in five years, four years, sorry, mm. that which didn't mean there's record. Mm. Um, it's pretty good form. Mm -hmm. You must tell a lie practically every time he opens his mouth uh, or writes anything. But um, you know, that's an extraordinary record. Some people just tell lies and they have motives, uh, bad, bad motives. So it, it does take effort. Mm. You know, none of this stuff is easy. You, you have to just not take things on trust. I think it's also Aristotle who said and it's something like an intelligent man is somebody kind of hold an idea in his head without believing it. Mm -hmm. He only believed in names, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so you don't have to... It, it's intelligent to be able to say, there's an idea. I don't know if it's true, mm -hmm. but it's an idea. I'll retain it, yeah. and then I can reflect on it from all sorts of other points sure. of view. So yeah, I can, think the, the problem is that education for our young people is such a factory and that nobody is giving you time to think and nobody is valuing the power of thought and reflection that's right and because of that until we can look because i've always felt that i i know that there's a fund of knowledge out there and if somebody shows me if I'm a seeker of knowledge, I will find that knowledge. I will find a way to it. So, as you said yourself, we are really spending most of our time, we should be spending our time showing people how to do the research, where to find the knowledge, where, and then test it. 
But mm. we spend our time telling people how to pass exams in order to get on a road that we are now have to question deeply, as you've said. Mm. We have to question those journeys because they're useless. Yeah, they are. Um, and I know, I know government will pay for education in order to turn out good workers. And good workers good. bring out, yes. and it has, yes. yeah. And, yeah. And good workers bring out, bring in taxes and they don't question too much. Yeah, seems, seems to work. Uh, but well. the power of thought, of, of, of recognising a child uh, and having the space to, to assist and support them, that's... The idea of education. In yes, them. I think it is more fact. I think there are experiments out there. I'm not an expert mm. on education experiment, but experiments where the students, if I may use that general term, have a much greater control over what they learn and when, and they, yet they still finish up yeah. at much the same place. They could still pass their leaving cert if that's something, but they finish up with a much more inquiring mind and a, probably a better understanding of how mm. knowledge is organised. Mm. And I compare that with, I mean, I taught medical students for pretty well all my life. Um, and medical students have, have time to have, they used to have about 32 contact hours per week. 32 contact hours mm. per week. Now, I reckon a, a decent working week for a student is 40 hours. If they're not doing 40 hours, they're not doing the job. And they're not probably going to do very well. That leaves eight hours for thinking mm. out of 32 hours. It doesn't allow you enough time in that 40 hours to even read over mm. uh, the, what, uh, two, three, 15 lectures that you've had during the course of the week, at least 15 lectures, and then two or three lab classes. Mm. That's how you get to 32 hours. There's no time for thinking. Mm. Now, I really want doctors who can think, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they can look stuff up. Mm -hmm. I don't mind them looking stuff up, but I want them to be able to think. Mm. Uh, and I want... I like everybody to think. Thinking is hard work, but it's also very pleasurable. One of the problems, I think, is that um, education needs to be funded. In order to be funded, it has to be, outcomes have to be measured. Yeah. And this mm -hmm. is one of the biggest problems. Mm -hmm. So we have schools that are on league tables. Okay, It's not so strong, the league tables here, but it is, it's still there. Mm -hmm. So we have like 95% go to third level. That's measurable. Um, you know, 10 A's in the league insert, that's measurable. Um, I was most recently in further education um, where, and I ran a literacy centre, so people would come in trying to read and write, and it was about reading and writing, but really it was about, you know, fulfilling, fulfilling potential and being able to go into the school and talk to the teachers and, you know, mm. read medical labels and things like that. But the funding came from, for the most part, from Europe, and they had to have measurables. Mm -hmm. So I would be arguing, it's the soft skills, it's what it gives to people you know, that they can lift their heads up. You can't measure that. So that's, you know, mm -hmm. and, and at any mm -hmm. meeting we say, oh yeah, we all know about the soft skills, but we mm -hmm. need to measure this. And mm -hmm. that was the problem, mm -hmm. do you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. and, then they, and you get teachers who have been told that there's, this is a standard you have to bring those children to. Yeah. The time to sit and tell the stories yeah. and watch how they become and develop as human beings. And group work and, 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 and all of yeah. those things that are just invaluable. Mm -hmm. um, it, and it's not their fault. They've got 40 children in the class. And nowadays, probably 10% of them are on are autistic or um, mm. bipolar mm. or, you children. know. And, and, and we need those children. Mm. We need those children because they think mm. differently. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, you, you, probably, you know, my grandson is autistic and he has such an amazing mm. brain. But... No teacher has the time to listen to a child who'll talk at them mm. for an hour and a half. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And will, and will develop, and, and, but can think differently. Mm -hmm. But there's no space for different yeah. thinking. There's two, I think there are two things there. Is, and I think the word measurable is key. I think mm -hmm. it, some things are easy to measure. You can measure whether a kid can read that level of vocabulary or compile mm -hmm. that, or an adult indeed can compile that level, but they can read words of this and sentences of this complexity or, or that complexity. That can be measured. That's relatively easy. It's much harder to measure the, what you call the soft skills, their, their ability to be empathetic, to understand, mm. to comprehend, 
and to measure their social skills. Yeah. But they're there, and it's just I don't think we work hard enough. That's they're trying to measure them. Different sets of yeah. They could measure There's them. a different set. Them, and maybe that language needs yeah. to be developed yeah. Yeah. in four teachers that, that you look at. Yeah. Yeah. That it's there are different words that are used to measure. I mean, mm. reading stories yeah. to children is about the most valuable thing you can do to small children. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of the most pleasurable yeah. things in life yeah. too. Mm -hmm. uh, it is. And I think everybody, uh, just really envious school teacher, could sit around with mm -hmm. 25, 30 kids. I hope not forty. Sitting around on a heap on the floor, and you're reading a story, mm. and they're absolutely wrapped. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's terrific. One, of, they're getting a whole thing out of that. They get a shared experience. It's a social experience, and they're getting yeah. an understanding, and they're getting all the things you get from decent literature: yeah. empathy, mm -hmm. moral values, come back to it, yeah. all, all of those things. And nobody has to be better than anyone else at listening to the that's story. That's right. You know, that's my, the key. My you're all in it together. Mm. My children went to a uh, school and um, <laughs> I have a very clear um, picture of their teacher sitting there in a pair of leopard skin leggings with a cigarette in her hand. <laughs> <laughs> she was a terrific teacher, mm -hmm. she, but she would sit perched there yeah. when you could smoke and, yeah. and they would tell stories and yeah. she would tell stories back and, you know, they're all... All of them converse are and, involved yeah. in the arts, they're involved in creativity. Mm -hmm. And that came as partly mm. with through her. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But she would never have been seen as a good teacher. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You know, because the curriculum was all over the place. Yeah. yeah. But uh, until we can give them permission mm. to to look and value mm. um, her skills, yeah. it's yeah. very. I think difficult. one of the other things we mentioned of class sizes as well. You know, particularly yeah. kids. You know. For a lot of teachers, it's management. Do you know? Yes, of course. It's it is. Yeah. Get me to three o'clock. Get me to three o'clock yeah. and then let me stay there till five o'clock filling out reports. This is it, And yeah. then let me go home mm -hmm. and correct until nine o'clock. Yeah. 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 Where's the space for the, you know, teaching how it's to just think? Exhausting. Or, yeah. 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 It's just exhausting. It's just nonsense uh, to have that much stuff. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, we were talking earlier uh, mm -hmm. before the meeting about facts not being knowledge that particularly young people I think well perhaps I'm just a, 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 mine might be untypical but when I when I think I, I wonder what, what something is well I could look that up mm. even I can do that on my mm. phone you know by the time I've thought that a young person has probably managed to look that up mm. and but I ask the questions do I need to know that <laughs> It mm. might be, I'm mildly curious about it, mm. but do I need to know this? The answer is I probably don't. I know that I can find it, that's maybe enough. Mm. Uh, and I tend incline to the, most of you will not have heard of Dennis Norton probably. I have. Yes, um, there you well, go. We are um, the well, more or less, but he, uh, one of a com pair of comedy writers. Dennis Norton had the view of memory that at a certain stage in life, in order to remember anything, you have to forget something to make room for it. <laughs> 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 uh, very clever man, very funny man. Um, yeah, and he, he was. Uh, and you know, there are times when I feel yes. I don't think I want to know that because if I might have, then I yeah, feel right something. if I remember it. <laughs> yeah. But what's the point of not knowing it if I don't remember yeah. it? Because can't, you can't use it then. But mm -hmm. if I need it, I can find it. Mm -hmm. And I have vast stores of information that I know I've got it. Mm -hmm. uh, and well, some things I've forgotten. I'm, God, but you know, I can yeah. probably do a search and find it very quickly. Mm. So, yeah, there are resources out there, and I've accumulated my own resources as you do. Uh, I'm a great collector of articles from newspapers, quick, quick cut and paste job. Okay, yeah, you mm. can cut and paste it, then you've got a word, that, and you've got to put the title on it you want to put mm. on it, then you can find it. Well, you can do mm. the search yeah. within the document, of course. So, um, yeah, so I think we do need to value those other skills uh, much more. Uh, about uh, understanding, imagination, um, social skills, mm. very important. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all have yeah. to be, we are social animals. Yeah. Above Absolutely. all else, we are social animals. Yeah. yeah, there should be, there should be courses in social skills in 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 transition year. Or, yeah, or intermediate, yeah, yeah, yeah. there should be. Oh, actually, can you imagine all, all of me? I can remember when I was <laughs> sixteen. I, I, I wonder though, are we looking at social skills? Uh, from each generation looks at what is a social skill and are 
there are a whole generation of people who think social skills for, you know, communicating through a phone, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, joining groups of strangers online, mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. that, that how it's, what is social skills? Yeah, I guess it, some kind of, I, I guess it could be in the course, but wouldn't it be like, maybe discovering the empathy that you have with other people, even if you might be of different points mm, of view, yeah, that you can yeah. come to a certain kind of say, okay, look, I, I've come this far. Can you come this far with me? And you go, okay. Yeah, I, I well, how to manage all social that kind situations of as well. Yeah. And that, really the skills that, that, that level. And the stuff that causes anxiety. Yeah. You know, the, the, the anxiety is, is causing such a huge problem. Yeah. It's such a huge problem. I mean, it's an today. extraordinary, mm. huge, it's a huge problem. Yeah. And I, was, I also think that, you know, we're looking at young people and not recognising, you know, that we could be teaching children to be mediators. Yes. We can teach children to be so many things mm -hmm. that they they could develop later on. It doesn't really matter that they don't, mm -hmm. but that you look at the, those soft skills, the skills that help, help them negotiate their mm -hmm. life, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, just even going no further than a, a sort of nuclear family. You've got to yeah. negotiate with your kids <laughs> if your yeah. life is to be bearable, bearable, and you need to find ways of doing it. I think of, uh, in my own life, I, I read some time ago a set of questions asked at interview for places at Oxford uh, in the biological sciences, which is my M. And I looked at the questions, and they're all very open-ended questions. They don't want to know what you know. They want to know how you handle the questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I thought, when I was 17, 18, how would I have done all those questions? And I think, well, I had a fair idea of what's going on in those questions. I think I'd have made a decent fist of the questions. Mm -hmm. What I would not have been able to do was walk into a room with five old men sitting around a table, as they would have been in my day, when I mm -hmm. were yeah, professors yeah. when I was a lad, uh, sitting around there saying, this is Professor So-and-so, Professor So-and-so, and this is Professor So-and-so, uh, do sit down, tough uh, <laughs> yeah, it was boom. Uh, now, I was from a very unsociable family. My family, my parents didn't socialise, so I never really had a conversation with an adult, I realised when I thought mm -hmm. about this situation. And... Consequently, I was quite unskilled, and I probably would not have been able to equip myself very well in that okay. social situation because I didn't have those social mm. skills. Compare that with somebody from a very privileged, wealthy background who's been to one of the major public schools in Britain, where they have all the social skills. They yes. might be psychopaths, but they might have. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the but they have good yeah. social skills. They can walk into a room anywhere and be confident, mm. and that. And in that situation, they are well able to say, how do you do so, how do you do so, you know, and all this stuff. And they have that, and they're the right kind of chap, and they, they'd be in like Flynn, whereas like to me, would you mm. hook yourself off to Birmingham or Newcastle, which is what I did. Um, so, not that I went applied to Oxford, uh, way out of my range in those days. So, yeah, so I think that that's, those social, that's what I think about social skills, when you can manage... Uh, you know, to walk into a room and speak to people. Mm. I heard somebody recently saying that, though, that you still have that. That's very much there. Um, you know, Trinity Access Programme, you mm. would be familiar with I that. Worked on it, and yeah. um, so when I was teaching the secondary school, so a lot of our, it, was, it was a kind of a challenging school, but a lot of our students would have gone to the Trinity Access mm, Programme fabulous. and got in, and it's fantastic. But they always had this inferiority mm. complex because the Tala accent, you know, mm. or whatever, mm. and they, yeah, they do. didn't, you know, they never went to, you know, the rugby school or whatever it was, yeah. do you know what I mean? So, you know, mm. there's, that's still there. And they would come in without a social network, other Absolutely, than Tala. Yeah, yeah. Whereas kids who come from Black Rock, they mm. come with a social network into the college. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the Mount Anvil girls and all the rest that's of it. it. They yeah. come in from these social groups. They come in and they're a bunch of them in together, all mm. doing much the same things and yeah. having mm. the same expectations. Whereas you come in, you're the one, the kid from Plundalkin or Tala or wherever, mm. and they know as soon as you open your beak who you are and they mm. think they know what you are, which is mm. not true. They know where you're from straight away, as well as any other problems you might have. Now, the Access Programme did give them terrific social mm. skills, oh, yeah. but yeah. it doesn't get rid of that entirely, yeah. unless you're Lynn yeah. Rowan, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> who yeah. is just terrific. Yeah. Uh, she's amazing. I've 
her three or four of her pet talks to incoming students mm -hmm. or mat to mature students contemplating coming in. Right. Yeah, mature students visiting a couple of days or whatever it was. Absolutely sensational. Okay. Absolutely mm -hmm. sensational. Fire them up, no end. Uh, and it's just, that's great to see. She's mm -hmm. achieved that and she worked out why she wanted to achieve it because she, she wanted to make changes mm -hmm. and she needed, mm -hmm. she knew she needed to learn the language of the people who have the power. Yeah. Mm. which is done mm. and she was a single mother and she had been on drugs mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and, and when she was president of the students union in college she had at least one child living in college with her right. <laughs> that child must have had a fantastic yeah. education <laughs> living in college yeah. now students union offices get about a fair bit they'd spend a lot of time sleeping on other people's floors okay, around yeah, the country because yeah. they go and visit other mm. students yeah. union offices and usually the options are sleeping on a sofa or on the floor. Mm. Uh, so she presumably took her kid with her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unless her mother was doing great duties or somebody else. But anyway, living in college must have been a great experience <laughs> for an eight-year-old or nine-year-old. <laughs> yes. But yeah. they, they do a lot of social skills uh, are, uh, and things like that. Take them out to places and they're at parties. And you can see them develop during the course of a year. Oh, yeah, mm. It's just fabulous yeah. to mm. teach them. Oh, it's a wonderful programme. Mm. And that managed to get it into both Oxford and Cambridge, right. which is, yeah. mm. Cambridge was a little more difficult to find. Okay. Well, we back in the bog there, in the fair. So, yeah, it was, but it is a wonderful programme. Fabulous people working on it and fabulous students. Mm. I really, I just mm. ran, got to the stage, I, I can't face marking it on my exam. Okay. Oh, my brain has had it. Mm. I just can't do it anymore. <laughs> After what that was to be uh, 44 mm. years of marking right. exams, yeah, doesn't do your brain any good. Yeah, okay, thank you for all of that. That was very oh, interesting. Thank you all, too. I forgot to add that at uh, our next meeting, it'll be in number eight, Murtaghill Terrace, um, for our, okay. our mince pies and mulled wine evening, <laughs> and that, uh, we may have it in the first week or the second week in December. If it means that we can gather more goods for Katrina, then I'd be inclined to go with the second week. But I'll keep sure. in touch with you when I Great. when I write that email about um, what, what we're collecting. Great. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Alan, so yeah, much well, for you. coming down you, from Dublin. I can talk to myself all day. I yeah. can do, but it's much nicer to come and talk to somebody else and, and get other ideas. So thank you for those. Thank you so much.